I'll show you how to play that ragtime piece and give you my single best tip to help you play parts like that in a bit. But first, there are a few hurdles that we need to overcome, like changing chords at a breakneck pace, getting your thumb to play the bass line, and of course, managing that off kilter timing. But before we dig into all that, we gotta get one thing right out into the open. The chord progression just doesn't make sense, at least not on the surface. I mean, I played seven chords in that short example, but only two of them are in the same key, but they sound good. So why? The answer is in something called secondary dominance, and it's huge in ragtime music. To make sense of this, we gotta take a step back and look at how chords normally function in a key. Specifically, we look at the chord built off the fifth tone of a major scale. In G major, that's a D note. If we harmonize that to a four note chord, we get a D7, and this is called the dominant chord, which has a strong pull back to the G major chord called the tonic. That relationship is so strong, it's like a gravitational pull from the dominant to the tonic. And ragtime leverages that pull in a big way. We can change several of those resolutions together, so let's work backwards to see this in action. We know there's a strong pull from D7 to G because D7 is dominant function, but we can create that same pull into the D chord. We just have to think of the key of D for a second and find the chord that has that same dominant function in D. In the key of D, build the chord off of the fifth note of the scale, that's an A. So let's listen to an A7 into D. But hang on, we aren't targeting D major here, we're actually targeting D7, so let's hear that. There's still a really strong resolution here because the D is a seventh chord. It feels like it still wants to go somewhere and that somewhere is back to G. So now we have a chain of three chords, two seventh chords into our tonic that really pushes the progression forward. And we can actually keep going using the same process by resolving E7 to A7 and B7 to E7. We're chaining them together and this is found really often in ragtime blues. This helps these seemingly unrelated chords make sense. And this idea of secondary dominance was a huge light bulb moment for me in ragtime blues. It helped me understand the chords and how they chain together, which helped me flow into the chord changes without thinking so much. And that comes with practice, of course, but the trouble is you often have to do this at warp speed in ragtime blues. So how do you do that? Knowing how the chords fit together can help with quick chord changes found in ragtime blues, kind of like how you can likely strum a G, C, and D chord without thinking. And if you can't, you should definitely take the tips I'm about to give you and apply it there first. But how do we change chords so fast? That's really what we're after. First, you have to know the chords on their own. So test if you really know it by taking your hand completely off of the fretboard, then form the shape with your hand as you're grabbing the neck. Can you nail it? If so, I think that's a really good signal that you know the chord on its own and if not try this let's say we're a little iffy on the B7 chord shape so make the shape on the guitar and then release the chord but just hover just above the strings and then press back down this on and off technique really helps now, I picked this up from a video from Andy guitar and it's absolutely brilliant although it was aimed at beginner guitarists it works really well for learning more advanced chord shapes as well and once you know each chord shape, then practice the changes in the progression. Make sure you change at the right time, keep your fingers close to the fretboard, and strum the chords as you go and make sure that you can hear each note cleanly. This helps you get familiar with the chords in the sequence, but when it's time to speed things up, you've got to know the progression cold. Don't be surprised by a chord change. Know where you are in the progression and the chord that's coming up. And if you haven't memorized the chord progression, then use a chart or just jot down the chords to help you keep track. You gotta think a little bit ahead when you're playing. There's not a lot of time to do this in a fast tune, so practice slowly and then increase the tempo. One, two, three, four.
This helps you clear the hurdle of changing chords quickly, but if you're playing ragtime, the next hurdle is crucial, and I bet you know what it is. I came to acoustic blues through thrash metal, which is a weird journey. I know these styles couldn't be further apart. Metal being primarily electric and acoustic blues, well, acoustic, but also picking. I used a pick 99.9% .9 of the time in my metal playing days. And with acoustic blues, I was doing a lot of finger style picking. That means that I needed to train up my thumb and there wasn't a lot of carryover skill from metal to help me out. So I had to get back to basics and drill the fundamental movements. That's what actually worked for me. And for blues, that means playing dead bass and then alternating bass. And that's really heavily used in ragtime. So how do we drill the core movements of alternating bass for ragtime blues? Try this. We're gonna start with a two string alternating bass line, the fifth string and the fourth string. So let's fret a C major chord. And even though we're really just going to play two notes, the fifth string and the fourth string notes here, go ahead and fret the index finger on the C note second string because we're often playing out of a chord position when we're doing alternating bass. So what we're going to do is just use the thumb to pluck the fifth string, only the fifth string, nothing else sounds, and then the fourth string. And just go back and forth between the two of those. In the beginning, you don't have to pay too much attention to timing, just get the movement down. We can train the timing later with a metronome. But I want you to do something with your picking fingers as well. Let's get them into position. I'm gonna put my index finger on the third string, just kind of hold it there so that the third string won't make a noise. And then my middle finger on the second and my ring finger on the first string like this. So this is kind of a default picking position for me and it sets you up to do some cool finger picking, but I just want you to hold those, just rest them really on the string while you're moving your thumb. This is gonna help you even with a simple exercise, not that it's easy, but there's not a lot going on here. And that's kind of the idea. We want to isolate the thumb with these two strings. So start here, and like I said, eventually, get your metronome out and play to the click so that you know you're doing this in time. The thumb is the timekeeper in a lot of acoustic blues, so that's very important. Then what we're gonna do is move from this C to G. Now what happens when we do a G chord, and you might fret it this way, I like to fret it this way, but what happens is we switch our bass strings to another two string alternation, but they're not next to each other sixth string and the fourth string. So once you get the movement down and notice that my fingers are still resting on the strings, switch back and forth between these two. A couple of measures or even one, one measure of each. Once you get the hang of that, we move on to a three string alternation over this C major chord. Notice what I'm doing here. The first bit is a five four. Then I'm moving only my ring finger, keeping the rest of the chord planted and playing the G bass on the third fret of the sixth string and doing a six four alternation. So five, four, six, four. You can let them ring. It doesn't matter. We're really focusing right now on the movement. This will be tough in the beginning and some will tell you just to push through and eventually you'll get it. But that didn't really work for me. I want you to go deeper than that. Why is it tough? Is it tough on just a three string alternation? Is it coming back to the six string that's a problem? Go deeper and get informed about the real problem. I find it's often a small thing hiding in a bigger technique that's giving us problems. And when we focus on improving the small thing, we can actually solve the problem. How about that? And after you get control of your thumb, it's time to add the fingers in a pattern like this. This is where things See you fun. These two measures closely resemble the piece at the beginning of this lesson, but let's take a look at the bass first, and then we're going to bring in the melody notes, the top three strings. We're playing a 6-4, six, 6-5, six, 
4, alternating bass line over the G chord, and then the next measure switches to a 5-4 over B7, and then a 6-4 over the E7 chord. Now, what we're doing is picking in between those. And when you're getting used to this, don't worry so much about the ragtime bounce. We're gonna learn how to dial that in later in this lesson, but we wanna get in between those bass notes with your top three strings. What we're doing is on the end of one, pluck with the index finger on the third string. For beat two, I'm gonna pinch with the first string, which is under the chord, that's a G note. The fact is, you could just loop that. To make a little exercise out of this exercise. And then we're going to bring on a little movement on the first string. All right, so beat three, we pinch the open first string and then back down. So we're pinching and getting in between. That's a key skill. We want to be able to do that all while the thumb is doing its thing with the alternating bass. And then we basically moved that idea over into the chord change. Right? That's the same picking just with a different alternating bass line as the first half of the first measure. And then pinch, note in between, that's the D note for the E7. We did move that from the first string to the second string if you're looking at it from a pattern point of view. But playing the right chords, even at a fast tempo, with good bass picking technique, won't get you into that ragtime sound. There's another hurdle to clear, and it's right there in the name, ragtime. The term ragtime is a shortened version of ragged time. Ragged meaning broken up, maybe a little off kilter or wonky. That's the bounce that you get with ragtime. And it's not easy to nail, even if you've got the blue shuffle thing running through your veins. But here's how I went to work on getting the bounce. I practiced at an exaggerated swing rhythm. Let's work on this bounce with the second couple of measures from the example. We're gonna play out of this long A, and this A chord position. We'll move a little bit between the two and I'll show you when and where in just a second. We'll also incorporate some filler notes on the off beats under the bar at the third string. And the bass line is gonna do five, four, five, four throughout, okay? So we're gonna start by holding the long A, play the bass, and then and of one, I'm gonna pick that third string. Back to the bass, but this time pinch with the melody note and then back to the third string. Then pinch, but drop down to the A7, and then back in between the beat. So that's an off beat there, the high A, and then bass filler. All right, so that first measure. In the next measure, a little bit less going on. We're gonna pinch, drop down, bass, go back up, bass, drop down, and then bass. So the next measure. Okay, so here's how we work on this to dial in the bounce. Everything that's in between the beat, the one, two, three, four count, those are the off beats. And we're gonna take those notes and we're gonna play them as closely as possible to the down beat. We're really exaggerating the feel of this by pushing those eighth notes next to the beat. Here's what it'll sound like. Again, we're practicing at the extremes here, so you know what it feels like to push that eighth note close to the main beat. Over time, you'll probably relax that a little bit, but you'll still have that stumbling into the beat feel that comes with ragtime music. All right, now we've got the chords, we got the bass and that bounce. Here is the most important advice for learning ragtime. Focus on the melody. Let's take a closer look at the melody of this example from the beginning of the video. Let's hear the melody by itself. Now 
Now, there are a few more measures, but we're gonna pause right there. It's important to not lose sight of the melody. With all that we've got going on, the finger picking, the bass line, some of the fancier guitar techniques, it's really easy to do that, but that's not what we want. What we're gonna do here is keep that melody in mind and just apply the alternating bass. We don't wanna do the filler notes or the fancier parts, just hear it like this. Maybe that feels a little bit more manageable as you're getting into ragtime blues. We can certainly speed it up and add those filler notes. I think they start to really fill out this sound. That's why I call them that. But if we just do this, we've got a cool little tune happening, right? Let's keep going. next couple of measures are D7 with the open first string to kind of move the melody along and then back to G and then down to G7 right here, the first fret on the first string before kind of repeating the quick part of the progression where we go B7. All right, so that's the alternating bass with just the second string or sorry, first string, second string, first string. Then the same thing over the E7, all right, but actually we kind of punch down on B4 there. Another measure over the long A and A7. Then we go back to D7 and kind of build things for two measures here. All right, and notice the melody there. Right? It climbs up to our G, the resolution there, our home chord, our tonic. And there's something that happened just before that last measure. We played the G note before the chord actually changed. And that actually happened a lot throughout this. The melody is moving forward, even back to the first measure. That note, that F sharp, as we're changing to the B, kind of hints at the coming chord change. It really moves things forward. Guess what, we did it again there with A. Right, there's the downbeat, the bass, but we played the C sharp under the A before we got there. Right? We kind of left that alone for a few measures here before back to it for the end, right there. We've got our hands full with ragtime blues, that's for sure. There's the bass line, the bounce, the chords, but we can't lose sight of the melody. It's the part of the tune that you'll hum later. Everything we just talked about is there to support the melody. So take time to make sure that the melody is clear and make sure it has that same bounce that we talked about earlier. And here's a happy little bonus. The melody it can often kind of guide you through the chord changes. If you take that idea and go back to the example, I think you'll see how the melody leads the change. Changes. But this all builds on solid finger picking skills beyond alternating bass. You're going to need to build dexterity, separation, independence. So I've put together a free finger picking quick start for you that you can download at the link in the description to help you build some really nice foundational skills in finger picking. I'll see you in the next lesson. Until then, practice smart and play on.